within a dream. Okay, so we're going to talk about the historical context of the book, The Scarlet Letter. That's where we're at today. Um, 1600s, that's when the book takes place. Again, it was written in 18, or published in 1850. So it took place 200 years before, before he wrote it. And he wrote it 200 years ago. So, um, written in this takes place in the 1600s, and the Puritans were a group of people that came from England and other places uh, to Massachusetts. Uh, they were they were godly men and women who prioritized living godly and gracious lives according to what the Bible says. They were very strict because they prioritized God's word and what it requires exactly. They prioritized it so highly. Uh, so because of that, they were very strict. They took sin very seriously, and there were laws that meant that people were put to death for things that were that nowadays we we don't have. It's not against the law at all, like homosexuality, for example, um, or even just an adulterous affair. Those are things that were on the books, and people could be put to death for because the Puritans cared about what God's word said so highly. But so did the Pharisees, right? Pharisees were very strict when it came to God's law. The difference was that the Puritans also emphasized a gracious life. They really prioritized mercy because they knew that God is merciful. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't people who were legalistic and uh, who didn't get it right. Obviously, there were because people aren't perfect. But in general, the Puritan pastors and people were very gracious, kind, loving people who also highly prioritized God's word and shunned sin um, and sought repentance from people rather than simply uh, the consequences. <clears throat> Hawthorne, the author, was a descendant of these early Puritan settlers, uh, but that is a heritage that would haunt him and inform his writing all his life. So you'll find that so much of Nathaniel Hawthorne's writing really just knocks against the Puritans. He hated them. Uh, and it was because he's related to the Puritans in Salem, Massachusetts. So if we go back to uh, this for Yuri's sake, uh, you'll see that he was born in Salem, Massachusetts in 08. His dad died when he was four years old. He went to college in Maine, and when he was 21, 1825, he graduated and moved back to Salem, Massachusetts. So he's from Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, and anybody remember what happened in Salem, Massachusetts involving the Puritans? Yes, the Salem witch trials. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's great, great, great grandfather, John Hawthorne, was one of the judges on the panel that sentenced the, the the girls to death in the Salem witch trials. So he could never let that go. He hated that he was related to the Puritans, and he just hated the Puritans for that. He thought that that was just so wrong what happened there. Um, so let's. That's a little bit of background as far as who Nathaniel Hawthorne is, his uh, ideas of the Puritans. Uh, I, as you read the Scarlet Letter, I want you to get a sense for uh, how he's treating the Puritans, how he's portraying them, and then compare what the Puritans are like in the Scarlet Letter with what they are like in their own literature when we read their literature in Unit 2. So in Unit 2, we're going to read their own works of like from when, what they were like and what their people were like and what they taught and uh, who they were and compare what you think of Nathaniel Hawthorne's version of the Puritans and their own version of themselves. Okay? So I want you to have that in mind. Um, so let's talk about adultery. Uh, what is adultery? How would you define adultery? And try to speak up. I have my microphone here so, so that you can, um, but still, you're going to have to really speak up. What would you say is adultery? Okay, so when you have an affair with someone who's not your spouse, yeah. 
a sexual affair? Um, yeah. Okay. Good. That is adultery. Anybody else have anything to add? What if it's what if you're not married, or what if one of them is married and the other one's not? Is it adultery for both? Um, I'd, I'd say so. Okay. Would you guys agree? Okay. What if neither one is married? Is it, still, is it still I'd adultery? Still, I'd still say it's adultery. Okay. Would you guys disagree? No. Okay. Um, what if it wasn't a sexual affair? Uh, they, it was just a kiss. Is that adultery, or is that not adultery? Ooh, it is. You think Yuri? You think it is? I would say so. You say so. Okay. Why? Why would you say that's adultery? What makes adultery adultery? Is it the act? Okay, so you are bound to somebody else and you have an emotional and romantic attraction and you act on it in some way, not necessarily having sex. Okay, um, but what if you're not bound to another? What if you're not married? Is that adultery? It's not. <laughs> See? I would, I would say so. Okay, okay. Um, for, and for one... Like for one reason, it's like you don't know if you're gonna get married on the future. On the future, so by doing that, you're like you're cheating your future spouse, whoever he, he or she may be. Yes. Yes. Um, and and well, what if you what if you're not gonna get married? Like, like well, first of all, you never know that. And second mm -hmm. off, you know, Jesus says that just looking at a woman um, lustfully is considered adultery. Aha! Uh -huh. So we have a definition from the mouth of Jesus Himself that says. Adulterous does not necessarily have to be even mutual, right? So even in his version, Jesus says you can be adulterous or commit a form of adultery and never even involve the other person, just looking at them. So that would include things like pornography. Then. Yeah. Good, good. Um, and, and like we said, kissing. When you're breaking that emotional commitment you made, right? So would you say that kissing before you're married is a Ooh, good question, right? <laughs> yeah, it's something to think about. <laughs> I'm not going to say it is or not, but it's something to think about. You should think about where's the line? What exactly is right and wrong about this? So, okay, uh, but that's also getting to a wrap. Okay, what does the word puritanical mean, and what is your impression of who the Puritans were? Have you guys ever heard anyone call somebody else puritanical or anything like that? No. No? Okay. I have a song. Remember the, the artist that we did that one song with? Remember that? The Auto Domesticated Animal? Mm -hmm. The, um, where are we talking? They, um, have another song. And they mentioned the Puritans. So we get to practice another little analysis. Sweet. Is there a way to show lyrics as the song plays on iTunes? It's got to be a way, because you can do it on your phone. How far did you guys make it in your reading? Um, I 
Okay, so let's listen to this song. So the key word here is Puritan, um, but he mentions God. Uh, how how do you know that you what you're doing is what God has told you to do, and that it's not just your own voice? Um, but he's pretty mad at people <laughs> for using their own voice. Um, how? Tell me again, what makes a good man? Is he free of blood on his hands? Does he only say what anyone can? Does he clean lines and Puritan? Okay. In that context, what does Puritan mean? What do you mean? Okay, pure and free of of having committed sin. Does that make sense? Okay. Would you guys add anything to that? Is it free of having committed any sins? Or is it that's it's just a good person? Okay, so... Um, 
It's kind of on the verge. I, I'm not sure if he's saying just simply, is it a good person? Or if he's using this with the cultural context that we now have of purity. Somebody who thinks that they're perfect. Oh, I never do anything wrong. Right? Uh, and I kind of get that sense because of the second verse, which is why I included it. Um, tell me again how you can talk to God and how he tells you what to do and how you're sure it's not your own voice disguised as something absolute. So somebody who has who thinks like this is going to think it, it might might be somebody who justifies everything they do and thinks they don't do anything wrong. You, you see what I mean? Now, I'm not sure that's how the extent to which he's using purity. But you can see that People do use Puritan in that way. They, they think of Puritan people as people who are high and mighty on their high horse and holier than thou people. Uh, that's the idea that people have of Puritans, and it comes back to this book. It's because Nathan in part because Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote this book and it became so popular, populated this false interpretation of who the Puritans were that so many people use the Puritan name to describe that kind of person. The kind of person that the Puritans are in the book. But that's not who they were. And I hate the book for that reason. And every year I a little I go I get every year I get I feel better about using it. But right at the beginning even I was like, I don't want to use this book because it's so inaccurate. That's not who the Puritans were. Um, but what it does do is it provides a great opportunity for you to see where we get our ideas of the Puritans that are propagated in the world, uh, and why the world so quickly accepts those, even though it's historically not accurate. Um, and then you too, we, we read what the Puritans actually wrote about themselves and what they were like. So, um, and we correct their ideas. So I, I like using the book more. Um, but it's important to recognize that the Puritans were um, are labeled incorrectly. Okay, um, so why is that? It's because they prioritize saying no to sin and dealing with sin seriously. And our world, our culture, does not do that anymore. Uh, we trivialize sin. Uh, for example, um, I just watched a movie last night with my wife, sleeping in, sleepless in Seattle, about a guy who uh, his wife died, and then he. It's a love story, so he falls. Um, but we were talking about how a lot of these 80s movies, they trivialize uh, sex before marriage. It wasn't, there wasn't anything bad in the movie, but they implied that it was normal for people to have sex before marriage. And now it is normal. Like that is just rampant and it's not looked down on. Even among people who say they're Christians, well, you got to try each other out and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that, that it's shifted. In the 80s and 90s, there was a huge focus on normalizing it, and now it is normal, and now they're normalizing LGBTQ problems, right? So they're, they're trying to shift this problem because they're always running away from God's standard. God says it's wrong, and that doesn't ever change, but they're trying to run further and further away from that standard. Um, the world doesn't like people like the Puritan who stand on God's standard and say, no, adultery is serious. Uh, fornication is serious. Um, so what Nathaniel Hawthorne has done is he's taken the idea of adultery, which was against the law back then, uh, so that you could be put to death for it because that's what the Bible says in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament law is good, even if we don't use all those laws now. It's still, it's not a bad thing. So, so they used that law. They said you should be put to death for the sin of adultery. Uh, because sin is serious. And we don't want a community that accepts that sin. And so we weed it out. Right? Um, what he's done is he has, has made a mockery of them. So in the story, she commits adultery. And she is shamed for her sin. And this is why we had the conversation about shame and embarrassment um, and ostracizing people. So that she is shamed for her sin and it's looked on as a mercy 
overmuch is what one of the gossiping women say. They say, oh, the magistrates are being too merciful to her. She should be put to death. Um, but instead, they're just shaming her. But that's just so backwards because they're not being merciful to her because, as we read in the story, the community ostracizes her and shames her. Is shaming and ostracizing ever called for in God's word? No, it's not. Uh, and so what Nathaniel Hawthorne has done is he's twisted it. He's, he's taken what the, the Puritans were trying to do in living according to God's word. He's flipped it on its head, called it merciful. But what he's calling merciful is, a, is not according to what God's word says. So he's just he's twisted thing. It's not accurate. But it's important to see it in the book and in the story as we read. Because everybody else in the world takes him in his word. The, Nathaniel Hawthorne says Puritans were like that. Yeah, don't get off your high horse. Don't be holier than thou. Don't be a Puritan. Um, when in reality, if we were more like Puritans, a lot more of the problems we see today would not be here. So, uh, we're going to get into more of the Puritans specifically next unit. But this unit, I really want you to pay attention to the language that Hawthorne uses to describe the Puritans. Uh, because part of anal analysis is those key words, right? Is analyzing specific words like we did here with finding the Puritan what does he mean uh, and what lines what other key words give us a sense for what like what could we use as proof to prove our point that Puritan means whatever you think it means in that song so, um, focusing on those key words that Hawthorne uses to talk and describe about the Puritans is really important um, okay so let's go back to this um, have you ever heard anybody talk about a scarlet letter? Or a scarlet woman? No. No? Yes, you have, Gary? Where? Probably in a book, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where, what did it say? Do you remember? Is what? Tarnished. Ooh, okay, good. Uh, anything else that you can remember to add to that? Okay, so white is pure and red is tarnished. Good. Uh, and you're right, that red, that scarlet is going to come from, from this story. So scarlet means tainted uh, in the story. It means the woman who's given the scarlet letter is branded with a big red letter A for adultery. Uh, and because she's tainted. She, she is not a virgin. She has a baby. And she has no man. She's not a husband, no husband. And actually, we don't even know who the baby daddy is. So uh, it's a mystery. But um, good. Scarlet comes with a tainted uh, connotation. Uh, and that comes from, this, from the book. A lot of people, you're going to hear the scarlet letter. Uh, oh, that person's got a scarlet letter on their sleeve or something like that. Uh, you might hear a lot of people say that. And it comes from this story. Okay. Anybody have any questions about anything, Yuri? Even anything that um, maybe from yesterday? Any besides just like what did you cover? Because you can you can lose the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, then that's it.